um, I remember the, the Welcome Home March from 1988. I was in Nambour and that Anzac Day um, we led the, the march down the main street. Um, and inside, it, it was the first march I'd been to in a, in a long time. Um, and people were coming off the off the footpaths on either side of the street, coming right over to us and, and applauding and saying good on you mate and all this type of stuff. And inside I was screaming. I was screaming. I almost walked down to the parade. Um, why now? You know, I came home in 1970. You know, why couldn't that kind of thing happen happen then? Not 18 years later. 18 years is too long. The damage has been done. So just them saying, oh, we're sorry, or you know, welcome home, 18 years later, I didn't put much credence to that at all. I guess we are being looked after better now. Um, and I've even had a, a guy that was in the Malay, in Malaya, um, an army guy, when I said that I don't think um, people have learnt anything from our experience. And he, he actually berated me for saying that. He said, if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't know what PTSD was. And we wouldn't have the the the, you know, the support basis that we've got now. He said, I understand it was hard for you guys, but it would have been a lot harder for us if you hadn't have gone through it. Um, I guess the, the support is there now. Um, DVA look after us pretty well. Um, but I think it gets back to Too little, too late. Yeah. Good morning ladies and gentlemen, um, my name's Stuart Cameron and I'm your MC for the day. Um, could I have a show of hands please for those who were at dinner last night? Alright, so you've all heard the story of uh, the three pigs, we won't repeat that. But perhaps I'll start with a story of four mice. And I think perhaps it'll set the tone for today, actually yesterday as well, and uh, after we leave here into the future. It's a very simple story, a small farmhouse, a farmer and his wife, um, and in the kitchen, four mice have uh, a fairly cosy environment. It's a symbiotic relationship. And the mice actually have a number of friends on the farm. Uh, they've got a chicken friend, they've got uh, a pig friend, and they've got a cow friend. And every now and then when the farmer decides that he'll go and uh, do something to one of those animals uh, so that they can feed themselves. The mice scurry out and say to the chicken, make yourself scarce. Or they go a bit further and they go to the pigsty and they say to the pig, pig, get out of there, go for a walk. And occasionally they go down to the back paddock and they say to the cow, move off the farm for a day or so. And this goes on for some time. And then one morning, uh, there's a knock on the door and it's the postman and the farmer's wife brings into the kitchen, on the kitchen table, a simple brown package and the mice are peering out from the little hole and to their great shock she opens it up to reveal a mouse trap. So the mice are mortified. So they run out to the field and the first animal they come across is the chicken and they say to the chicken, we have a problem. 
the farmer has bought a mouse trap. Will you help us? And the chicken turns its back, kicks its legs and says, go away, I'm eating, I'm too busy. So next, they go to the pigsty and they say to the pig, pig, we have a problem. Um, the farmer has bought a mouse trap. And the pig looks at them and says, I'm sorry, but I'm too busy luxuriating in the mud. Don't annoy me. So they go to the cow, and the cow's grazing on some uh, very nice fresh grass. And the cow turns to them and says, not my problem. So the mice scurry back into the house. Now that night, the farmer sets the trap. Nice little piece of Parmesan. Now the mice have talked about this, and they've decided that they will not go anywhere near this trap. But one of them, later that night, is drawn by the odour of the Parmesan. And of course, we know what happens. The mouse goes up, triggers the trap, snap, and it's dead. The three remaining mice start wailing, as mice do. And that brings the attention of the farmer's wife, who walks in and sees this dead rodent in the trap, blood and gore everywhere. And she faints. The farmer, comes in, sees his wife on the kitchen floor, picks her up and takes her to bed. The following morning, she really hasn't recovered that well. So he decides to make her some chicken broth. The mice are in the kitchen, they're mourning. They don't go out and warn their friend the chicken as they used to do. And of course, we know what happens to the chook simple slope of the axe and the chicken is history. We progress a few days and we come to a point where um, the wife has not recovered at all. Indeed, she's been admitted to hospital. And the farmer knows that hospital food's not the best, except at green slopes. <laughs> and he decides to make her some bacon sandwiches well, you know what happens. The mice are still in mourning. The pig is not warned and the pig is dispatched. We progress a bit further and the wife actually dies. And the farmer decides that he'll have a wake and he'll put on a barbecue. The mice are still in mourning. No warning to the cow. And the cow becomes the barbecue. This is not a joke. There's a moral to this story. And the moral is quite simple. When someone comes to us with a problem, it's not their problem, it becomes our problem. And we have an obligation to help each other. Does that make sense? That's the moral. And that's why we're here. We come together as a collective to help. Now, we may not know the individuals that we help. That's not important. But the point is, we don't turn ourselves away from those who need our help. So let me talk briefly about the organisation I represent. Some have heard a bit of this last night. Uh, it was formed in 1916. It's been going for over 100 years. Uh, and it was formed around eight basic principles. And that was all about, in the Australian vernacular, mates helping mates. And that's why we exist. Um, We've somewhat changed over the years. Uh, we still provide um, a respite for some of those who uh, like to get together every now and then and talk. We've also branched out into medical research. And that's why in the last few years, RSL Queensland has contributed some $10 million to fund medical research, whether it be around post-traumatic stress or transition. Uh, we expect to do more of that into the future. We also went and looked at the issue of veteran homelessness because there was a lot of discussion around it, but not a lot of action. So we actually went and studied the issue. And that's resulted in RSL Queensland um, coming together with the Salvation Army, where we now have uh, a collaborative arrangement whereby we're providing for those who find themselves homeless. And I'm not just talking about the individuals who's living hard on the street because homelessness has many forms. We are also looking at 
other initiatives, transition, and helping servicemen and women into employment. And that's why just recently we went up to Townsville where we're going to run the pilot program. We briefed the commander of three brigade, uh, Brigadier Chris Field. Uh, he then got every one of his commanding officers together and said, you will listen to this brief and you'll get engaged. Um, earlier this week, we were visited by uh, Admiral Brett Wolski, uh, Ben Robert Smith, and uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Colin McDowell, who are on the Prime Minister's Advisory Council around employment. And they came to us wanting to know whether we would fund a website for them. Now, the answer to that, of course, was yes. But after we briefed them on our initiative, they said to us, can we join you? Because you're at least 12 to 18 months ahead of where we are. That's the face of the new RSL in Queensland. And we have a commitment to any veteran, no matter where he is or where she is across Australia. We're not worried about state borders. And for that matter, uh, next week, we're going up to Darwin for the simple reason there are a lot of servicemen, both current serving and former serving up in Darwin, who aren't getting the support they need. So we're moving across um, the state boundaries. We do this for the simple reason that in the Australian context, over 102,000 men and women gave their lives. And I always ask the question, how do we pay that back? Now, as a society, I think we have an obligation to do that. Because I'll pose a question to you. If any of those men and women, through whatever God-given right, could come back and stand in front of us and ask us some questions, how would we answer them? Perhaps the question would be, was my sacrifice worthwhile? Have you created a better society? Do you look after your mates? Do you remember me? Simple questions, but I think very powerful ones, which we need to remind ourselves every day. Now, it's not just the military context that I'm talking about either, because we've got the first responders. And the police, ambulance and fire services um, suffer much the same way as men in combat do. So I leave you with that challenge. We have one day left in the program. It's going to be an exciting day. Uh, we've got some great speakers, and I'm about to introduce our first speaker in a moment. But my challenge for all of us is, how do we work as a collective to solve those problems, which are global, but you distill it down to the individual? Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.